Conference as Director of Hispanic Ministries and Church Planting Coordinator. Originally from Ecuador, Ricardo has ministered over the past 30 years in a variety of responsibilities in South and North America, Southeast Asia, and West Africa as a pastor, conference director, and missionary supervisor. Ricardo is grateful to share life with his wife, Alicia, and their two young adult sons, Gabriel and Daniel. Ricardo's greatest joy is to see people who have been transformed by the power of God responding by sharing God's transforming love with others. Just imagine, <laughs> just imagine that, just imagine I'm talking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, I think now we're on. Thank you so much. Yes, I would like you to, to picture in your minds, you know, uh, churches thriving, where there are families with young children, where our young people are there in our churches, where people with experience are part of the process. Just imagine that. Um, the topic that they asked me to share with you this morning is about revitalization and evangelism. So when we think about the first revitalization, that would not be needed if our churches were thriving. Isn't that right? Yeah. We have to talk about this. And really, I know that I'm speaking to the choir. You are here. You have taken time off from your work. You are here because you want to see your churches thriving. But I would like first to address the question, why? Why do we have to talk about this topic? Why do we have to address this issue? I want to share with you some numbers that will explain to each one of us the why. The North American Division several years ago created a criteria to evaluate whether our churches were multiplying, which is the first category that you can see there, growing, plateauing, or declining. So I'll very quickly explain which, each one of those categories. For a church to be mo multiplying, which is the first category, it means that that church, the attendance of that church, is growing every year at 7%. And that the membership, not the real membership, but only 40% of the membership of that church is at least growing at 7%. Do you think that's a big thing to ask or a small thing to ask? So just imagine, if you have 100 members in your church, 100 members, we only take what? 40% of that, what would that be? 40, that's right. And we are saying that they are growing at 7% of that, what would that be? 2.8, that means three people every year. Is that a lot to ask or no? No, okay. So just imagine that multiplying churches are churches that are growing at 7% of their attendance. Their attendance is growing 7% and they have planted churches. A growing church is only a church that is growing at 2% of their attendance. Okay, so that means that we are asking very little. And then plateauing churches, you can see there, is just a line so there is no growth and no decline. But that's really a little deceiving because if you're not growing, what is happening? You are dying. That's right. And then the declining churches are churches that are not only plateauing, but their attendance is going down. All right? Now, let me show you the statistics. Okay? I, I, I'm just going to share the Carolina conference today. I could, uh, there are statistics about the whole division, the union. But let me share this. In 2017, what were the numbers for our conference? Declining churches, how many, what percentage? 41%. Plateauing? So if we add the declining, the, the plateauing, where are we at? That means that more than half percent, half of the churches, yeah, that we have in our conference are not growing. So that, 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 that's, a, that's something that we need to think about, all right? And really uh, be concerned about. Why? Because the growing percentage in 2017 was only, help me out, 32%. And the multiplying churches were only 6%. Yeah? 
Now, if we go to 2018, we can see that the numbers change a little bit there. 32% declining, 19% plateauing, growing is growing, but multiplying was? Yeah. Now, if we keep going, 2019, what do you see? Some change? So we are seeing that more than 50% of our churches and congregations here in the, in the conference were either declining or plateauing. Yeah, 50%. Now, why is this um, important for us to think about and to do something about? Because if you are not growing or multiplying, our churches are dying. So if we don't do something about it, what is going to happen with our churches? Yeah, we're not going to have very soon churches. Is that right? So we really need to think very carefully and pray about it. So we are trying to collaborate together, you know, all of us, and think and pray and say, what can we do to turn things around? So the, the bottom line is this. What I'm going to be sharing with you is important, but unless there is a revival, and unless we are uh, hungry and thirsty for the Holy Spirit in our lives, none of what I'm going to share with you is going to happen. Do you agree with me? Yeah, yeah the foundation, really, of any growth and anything else that we do is the Holy Spirit. But uh, at the same time, we have to be realistic about where we are at so that we know where we can go. I'm sure that if you are here, it's because you are committed to growing, to expanding. But let me tell you, let me share with you the numbers. Uh, in 2020, it makes sense that all our churches were what? Declining. Why? COVID. Is that right? So since the numbers, the metrics that we use are related to baptisms and attendance during, those, uh, during the year 2020, we did not have that data. Yeah? And I would like to tell you this. Is if you are leaders here, um, please tell your secretaries that we need attendance. Yeah? Because that's what gives us the information to, for all of these. And the sad thing is that not all churches are reporting attendance. Yeah? So what is the North American division doing about it? The average attendance in North America is 40% of the membership. So that's the number that we are taking, okay? So if your church did not inform attendance, we are taking 40% of your membership. Now, in 2021, you can see that uh, de declining went to 48% and plateauing to 4%. And then in 2022, um, we were at 47 between declining and plateauing. 2023 was a good year for our conference. You know, as you, you have heard, uh, baptisms continue to grow, um, and we praise God for that. We believe that the members are more involved, but what are we doing to revitalize churches in our conference? You know, so who? Who needs revitalization? Those churches that are either plateauing or de declining, yeah, or dying, that's right. And then how? That's the key question. How can we do that? Yeah, so in the next few minutes that I have, I want to share with you, uh, this is the plan that the General Conference has for holistic growth. You know, many times we talk about evangelism, or we talk about discipleship, or we talk about different areas of the process. But I think that if our churches are much more holistic in the way we do, then we will accomplish that. So there are five, five phases that are mentioned here. The first one is prepare. The second one is plant. The third one is cultivate. The fourth one is harvest. And the fifth one is preserve. I want to share with you a little bit about each one of those. Okay, the first one, prepare. What does that phase uh, communicate? What do we do in our churches to prepare? Prepare the soil of the heart with two things. Help me out. Which one? Yeah? Friendship and service. Uh, let me ask you this question. Do you think that our churches are doing well at this? What do you think? Yeah? Okay. So we could improve. Is that right? Yeah. So we can do a little more on friendship and service. That means connecting with our community. There is something that uh, our leadership here at the conference um, asked us to do, which is excellent, and is this thing. I want to to share this, this with you. Andrews University, about a year or two years ago, received a grant of $3 million. 
And what they did was they invested that in a center for community change. What is that? It's basically people who work, you know, the director is a guy who worked for ADRA in different parts of the world. So his work really is connecting with the life of the communities. Because they found that many of our churches have a difficult time establishing connections with the community. Do you think that's valid for your churches as well or no? What do you think? Yeah? Yeah, exactly. So sometimes the programming that we do is centered in ourselves. Is that right? So we need to project ourselves more to the community. So the Center for Community Change, what do they do? They come, they meet with the pastor first, they assess the gifts of the pastor, the vision that the pastor has, and then they meet with the board. And then they try to study what is, what, is, what, are, what is the vision that the board has, the leaders of the church. And then they assess the needs of the community. And they help pastor, leaders, to, es to establish, to create uh, ministries that are meaningful for the community. Um, I sent a letter to all the pastors in our conference yeah, uh, with this information. And I, we were hoping to start a pilot program with 10 churches. I asked the pastors, please, in order for us to work with you, we need you to vote this with your boards, you know, so that it has the support of all the leadership. Out of all the letters that we sent, we only received six back. Yeah? So we are working with those churches, and we praise God for those six churches. But I just want you to know that, you know, we still have four places available. Please go back, talk, your, talk to your pastors if you're interested in this. And what the, the beautiful thing about that, uh, this program, is the following. Not only do they help you to see what you are about, but at the moment of establishing a ministry with your community, they help you to apply for funding. So not all the funding has to come from your churches. Yeah, there is a lot of money out there uh, that different entities want to provide to us to help the life of our communities. Yeah, so that's a great thing that we have there available in the phase of preparation. Yeah, that means preparing the soul of the heart with friendship and service. The second one is to plant the seed with spiritual conversations with literature and media. Yeah, and I think... Some of the churches do okay at this, but we could improve, you know, in this area. The next one, cultivate. This is, I believe, where we're having the, the greatest challenge. You know, what is this stage? What, what is the, the purpose of this stage? To cultivate spiritual interest with ongoing Bible studies. Okay, let me ask you this question. I asked the same question yesterday with our Hispanic group downstairs. You know, I asked them, in a church in a regular church, in your church, how many people are the ones who are actively involved in giving Bible studies? What do you think? Out of 100? Two, five, yeah? So that's the reality. And then when, when you think about it, uh, why is that? I believe that many times we are afraid or we believe that we are not equipped enough. Is that right? To do it. Yeah, so we want somebody who knows more than us to do it, and, and it, it was interesting because you would say, you know, okay, Spanish churches are growing, but the reality is that the percentages are not much different, all right? So you have only a few people actively involved in actually sharing. If we could increase this number, I can, I, I can tell you this for sure, if we can increase the number of people who are actively involved sharing, we would see that our churches start turning the corner. But that will not happen if we don't have connections with our community. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, everything goes together. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, just, I, the way I see it is like this. If we have been in the church for a long time, the friendships that we have with people who are not Christians or who are not Seventh-day Adventists diminish. Would you agree with that or not? Yeah, exactly. You know, so the, the longer we are in the church, our friends are usually people from the church. And then when we uh, think about that, we realize, okay, how then do we connect with them? How do we connect with the life of the community? And then if we connect with them, how then we establish a Bible study with them? 
You know, so this, this aspect here, the third one, to cultivate spiritual interest with ongoing Bible study is a crucial one. And I would like you, you know, when you go back to your churches, to discuss that with your church boards. What can we do to increase the numbers of people who are actively sharing Christ? Now, there are many ways to do it. I'll just give you a couple of examples. There are several Bible studies that have QR codes that take you directly to somebody sharing the information. That means that you only have to bring people to your home. And then once they are there, somebody else can share for you. Yeah, but sometimes even that is difficult to do. Is that right? So I would like you to think about it, you know, because if we don't do something about this, what is going to happen in the next 10, 20 years? Let me tell you this. Many Spanish churches, yeah, that get started, our meetings downstairs, they rent from Methodists or from different denominations, and what is happening is that many of those buildings, you know, they started renting several years ago, and the numbers of those churches are dwindling. And the Spanish churches are buying those buildings. It will be very sad for our churches to happen the same thing. So we need to understand, the statistics are showing that that's the direction we are going. Unless, unless, we start thinking very carefully and praying about it so that God revives our hearts and we start using different ways of reaching out to our communities, connecting with them. Uh, many of the churches that today are, I can tell you, 10, 15, 20 years, if the numbers continue, what will happen? Harvest, yeah, the fourth stage. Harvest decisions with appeals to follow Christ and be baptized. So after the preparation has been done, after we have shared materials with people, and after we have cultivated not only the relationships, but we have shared with them the gospel, then we prepare what? A harvest, yeah? Many of us do harvest when we have not planted, yeah? My wife and I spent five years in Thailand doing church planting. And I will never forget, you know, when we arrived there, the retired pastor with whom we were working was welcoming a group uh, from the U.S. And they were going to do evangelism. So I asked the, the pastor, I said, hey, have you done preparation? Have you done anything? You have small groups. Have you done Bible studies? They said, oh, no, I'll just invite people for the community. I said, look, I'm coming from Ecuador in South America. We don't do that. We do preparation for many months with small groups, with Bible studies and stuff like that. Here is Thailand, you know, like, I mean, people are Buddhists here. Are you sure? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Question for you. How many people do you think came to that harvest? Give me a number. Five. Five. Yeah. The first night, none. Zero. Yeah, so this is the challenge. If we do not do the preparation, when we do the harvest, the reality is that we have very few people. And I think that's what is happening in our churches. We organize evangelistic meetings, but we have not done due preparation. Though we, so we get frustrated. We say, oh, evangelism doesn't work. But believe me, it works when we have done preparation, yeah? when we have cultivated things, so that there is a, really a harvest. And then if we do the harvest and do not preserve, then a lot of the people who come will what? Will leave. Yeah? If people make six to eight friends within the first six months, when they come to our churches, they are not going to leave our churches. Yeah, so we need to create mechanisms to do that. May God bless you. I want to warn you, hey, this is the reality, but God is powerful enough to revive us. Amen. We need to change the direction with God's help. May God bless you. Beth Benziger Grant grew up traveling all over the world sharing the gospel with her family. Beth is a commissioned Adventist pastor and has worked in specialized ministry as a hospital chaplain for over 20 years. She served as a chaplain in many healthcare facilities, including Loma Linda Medical Center in California and Advent Health in Florida. Beth is a seasoned international speaker who has a passion for people and the gospel. She is the joyful wife of Chaplain Vaughn Grant and mother of two sweet children. We welcome Beth to Evangelism Impact. Hello, hello. I am so excited to be here. 
I feel at home because evangelism runs in my blood, literally in my blood. My, um, both of my grandfathers, they were both evangelists. My dad's dad, Oliver Bensinger, he was a evangelist with Fortis Dedimore. Do you guys remember Fortis Dedimore? <laughs> Way back in the 50s and 60s? Yeah, so my dad grew up traveling America, traveling the country with his family in the evangelistic team. And then my dad, he decided, well, no, the Lord called him to be an evangelist. And after going to Southern, he graduated. Florida picked him up, and he went to his field school. And there in Florida, the evangelist at the field school was Clarence Pillsbury. And Clarence said, oh, Danny, Danny, I have a daughter. Her name is Gloria. And she plays the piano, and she sings. And oh, you, you got to meet my daughter, Gloria. She's playing for the meetings. And so, of course, you know, Gloria showed up, glamorous, gorgeous Gloria. That was her nickname. And my dad was smitten, and they ended up getting married. And my parents, they became like a power couple for evangelism. They traveled all over the world holding meetings. My dad worked for the Florida Conference, the Washington Conference, the Pennsylvania Conference. But um, he spent over about 25 years with It Is Written. So I got to grow up, my dad being an evangelist and the director of evangelism for It Is Written, I got to grow up traveling the world and seeing thousands and thousands of people come to Jesus. Incredible stories. So you might say, okay, well, you're an evangelist? <laughs> Well, the Lord, like you heard in my bio, called me to be a hospital chaplain. That's, that's still evangelism in its own way. And um, here I was about a year and a half ago. You know, I'm the director of the pastoral care, the chaplain's office for one of our Advent Health hospitals. I had my chaplain's team. I had everything going. And I had just had our third baby. Oh, so, and I mean, we're not young, you know, we're not young parents. <laughs> so I had my third baby and went back to work like normal. And the Lord gave me a word. Have you ever gotten a word from the Lord where it was so crystal clear? Verbatim, I will tell you the words. It was, Beth, ministry starts in the home. And I thought, but Lord, you called me to be a chaplain. This is, your, this is your will, right? Beth, ministry starts in the home. And then I started thinking of all the pastors, all the evangelists, all the missionaries, where we focus on everybody else, and then what happens to our own families, right? So I got an overwhelming sense that I needed to just put a comma put a pause in my chaplain ministry and focus my ministry in the home. So I did that. <laughs> after 20 years, I did that. And immediately after that, my pastor, well, one of our pastors, the family children's pastor, her name is Alex Harder, she said, Beth, I want to start this new ministry in the church for mothers of all ages, like zero through college. And the Lord keeps giving me your name that you should lead it and you should be the coordinator and start this ministry. <laughs> and I said, oh, well, let me pray about it because I didn't get that memo quite yet, you know. <laughs> so I'm like, let me see. So I prayed. I'm like, okay, Lord, you know, what, what, about, what about this new ministry? And I got the same message. Ministry starts in the home. And I thought, well, Lord, yeah, I, I did that. I'm home. I'm home. I have my three children. I'm swamped. I'm home. You know, <laughs> I'm doing it. 
But then it hit me. You know how God, when he unveils things from our eyes and we get to see things the way he sees things? It's our responsibility, yes, as individuals, to bring Jesus into our homes with our children, but it's also our church family, our local church family's responsibility to bring Jesus into the home of our church members and the outside community. So I thought, oh, this is bigger than just me (laughs) and my family. This is connecting people together and introducing them to Jesus. That's evangelism right there at the core. And I thought, okay, this is not just a little mother's feel good, let's get together and eat cookies kind of group. This is an evangelism outreach tool for our, our church to meet a need for the moms and to bring people to church and bring them to Jesus. So of course I said, yes, let's do it. So I got my team together. We, our church joined um, an organization called MomCo, not Costco, but MomCo, that's how you remember it, right? MomCo. And it's great because it's an international organization. You might have heard of MOPS international it's the same organization and what's great is this this organization equips churches with all the tools you need a curriculum resources videos everything you need to do the ministry so the leaders they don't have to worry about oh what am i going to do oh what am i and they don't have to invent the wheel it's all done for them and the icing on the cake is they have a children's program curriculum so when the moms come they bring their kids and their the kids get their own program and get to connect with Jesus so i said let's do it let's go and let me tell you, a year ago, September, we, we launched. And we had consistently, consistently, 50 to 60 moms come every month. And 30 kids every month, faithfully. But this is the kicker, OK? 60% of those moms are not church members. 60%. You might say, okay, well, who who are these people? They're backsliders. They are non-Christians in the community. And they're people who are looking and searching for a church family. Um, I'm in Orlando, Florida area. So, I mean, that's kind of like an Adventist ghetto. I mean, there's a lot of churches in that area, and a lot of people church hop for years. They just go to different churches. They never settle down. They never put their membership anywhere because they don't feel connected. So since we started, we have got about eight to ten families who were church hopping settle down and say, I feel connected to this church. I want to put my membership here. So we got, so far, we've gotten about 10 new families just from having the MomCo ministry. Also, we've had lots of backsliders come. You know, this is um, an exponential evangelistic tool. So the friends of friends of friends of friends invite because moms they need they they need that support they a lot of moms feel very alone and isolated and misunderstood and depressed and anxious and feel like a failure i mean i don't know if there's any moms out there that have felt like that but i have <laughs> but so many people have said to their friends, hey, come, come to the Mom Co. It's fun. We have an activity. We have a speaker. We have um, good discussions, deep discussions. It's not all surface feel good. And 
so many backsliders have come back to church because of that. Um, I think of Sarah. Sarah, she she's actually a pastor's kid. And she, um, you know, as a teenager, she kind of went off and did her own thing. And she ended up getting married and having a couple kids, marrying a non avenist and just living, living her life, uh, not in the church. And one of her friends, who was also a backslider, who was coming to our mom co, said, hey, Sarah, come join us. It's fun. So she did. And when she came, she sat, we have round tables, and she sat at the table, and she shared that that week she had got divorce papers because she said, my husband and I, is just not working out. I got divorce papers. I'm going to give it to him. And um, she was, you know, heartbroken. And immediately all the mothers just swarmed her and supported her. And no judgment. Just, I'm here for you. I'm praying for you. Here's my number if you need to call somebody and talk. And they said, hey, why don't you come to Sabbath? You know, why don't you come to Sabbath school? Bring the kids. Um, love to see you. And you know what? The next Sabbath, she was there with her kids. And her kids, it was so cute because her kids said, wow, Mommy, Sabbath school is like Mom Co. We learned about Jesus today. It, it breaks your heart because these kids would have never learned about Jesus otherwise. And so every Sabbath, she was there faithfully with her kids. And then we started noticing her husband coming to, to church faithfully. And just a couple weeks ago, I saw her and I said, hey, Sarah, how's it going? And she said, you know what, Beth? She said, since I've been coming to church here and coming you know, to the mom co-ministry, she said, my husband and I, we decided to put a hold on the divorce, and we asked our pastor, Pastor Brian, if he would give us marital counseling and also Bible studies because I want my husband and my children to know more about Jesus, and she wants to be rebaptized. So, I mean, that's just one of many stories that I have. I have, I have a lot. I could keep going. But, I mean, what's great about this mom co is you're in a bigger organization. So if anybody in the community Googles mother support group near me, your church will pop up. And we have had about six people come to our mom co group from the community, cold contact, because there is such a need out there for support. There's also been a lot of non-Christians coming. And I think of my friend Shilpa. She is uh, one of our church members, and she, she invited her neighbor. She said, hey, come to our mom's group. And, you know, the neighbor wasn't a Christian, wasn't any, you know, just nothing. I mean, you know, knew about God, but didn't, you know, follow Jesus. And so she came, and she loved it. And she said, wow, this is amazing. I want to come back. So she came faithfully. And let me tell you, after about three times coming, she went up to Shilpa and said, Shilpa, you know, you've always been, like, full of joy and peace, and, and you're such a sweet person. She said, I thought it was just you, but then I went to your church. Everybody's like that. And she said, I realized from going to those mom co-meetings that it's because of Jesus, because we introduce them to Jesus. It's the whole curriculum is gospel-based. And so she said, I want what you have. I want what everybody here has. And I want to learn more about Jesus. And let me tell you, she got Bible studies. Her whole family 
did Bible studies, and the whole family got baptized. So this ministry changes the homes. And if you want to change and transform a home, you really do need to start with the mother, right? Because if mama ain't happy, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, there is some truth to that. <laughs> but a mother can transform the culture in the home. And Jesus did that in his ministry, didn't he? He touched people's lives, and he not only healed them and touched their lives, but he transformed their home. And let me tell you, I, if you don't remember anything that I said, please remember this, okay? The power of the gospel is in our local church. The power of the local church is in our families. So the gospel ministry really, really needs to be prioritized to our families. So if you want to learn more, I can walk you through every detail. Come to my workshop, and I will help you get this ministry up and running in your church. And then you can have so many victory stories like we have at our church in Spring Meadows in Florida. God bless you. Leslie Louie, originally from Sri Lanka, has dedicated 50 years of service to the Seventh-day Adventist Church in North America. His diverse roles have included being a teacher, principal of both elementary schools and academies, education superintendent, conference secretary, and since 2011, president of the Carolina Conference. Leslie's academic journey at Southern Missionary College and Andrews University has equipped him for service across five conferences in North America. Leslie's life is enriched by his marriage to Carol, his beloved wife of 50 years. They have two adult children and three granddaughters. We are grateful to have him as our leader here in the Carolina Conference. Good morning and a happy Sabbath to each of you and a happy New Year to each of you. I am uh, very grateful to welcome each of you to our 2024 Evangelism Impact and it's, it's my honor and uh, sacred trust to continue serving you uh, in this is my 13th year as your servant leader for the Lord here in the Carolinas. On July the 23rd, 1844, James White wrote a short article called The Cause, and uh, that was in the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, in which he reported that the number of Sabbath-keeping Adventists was only about 100 at that time. By the year 1850, it became 200. By the year 1852, that increased tenfold to 2,000. And by 1863, that went, number went up to 3,500. And in 2017, we crossed the threshold of over 20 million members around the world. As a Seventh-day Adventist church, we have a solid organization and a very consistent biblical message. But how many of us as church members live in conformity to that message? Today, we need more who will reform our own lives through the power of the Holy Spirit and fewer who attempt to reform the lives of others. Being a genuine Adventist is not so much a matter of what we say, but rather a matter of how we live our lives. In Acts of the Apostles, Ellen White wrote, the church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. It was organized for service, and its mission is to carry the gospel to the world. From the beginning, it has been God's plan that through his church shall be reflected to the world his fullness and his sufficiency. This is one of the reasons why we are placing a significant emphasis on discipleship and have focused on a conscientious study of the discipleship handbook across the Carolinas, especially during this past year of 2023, coupled with a faithful evangelistic fervor. 
Jim Howard, who was the primary contributor to the Discipleship Handbook for the Seventh-day Adventist Church, just spoke with our pastors this week. And uh, he was at Nasoka Pines Ranch, and I heard him reference a term that I believe should really be the heartbeat of our mission here in the Carolinas, and that is discipleship making evangelism. God has called each of us to be here this weekend at Myrtle Beach, not just for a feel-good retreat, as much as many of us love, and I enjoyed looking out over the ocean this morning, but as leaders in the Advent movement to be Christ's faithful followers and laborers in reaching every single heart for heaven with the everlasting gospel and encouraging people and engaging them in the harvest calling of Jesus that's echoed in those beautiful words, his parting words to his disciples. And many of us will know this because we have gone over this many, many times. That's, and we call it the Great Commission. And with those words, it's, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe most of the things that I have commanded you. Ah, oh, you are awake out there. Okay, good. Teaching them to observe how much? All things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of this age. Now, you know, this is where a simplistic reading of this gospel is dangerous. Yes, you, um, you know, you normally see, you normally did see people back then accept the gospel, accept Jesus, to be baptized into the early Christian church. The challenge is that the church was in its infancy before doctrinal and lifestyle commitments were put into place, and this, the Bible shows us that this early approach led to some problems. And uh, those problems were that some people didn't even know who the Holy Spirit was. And some of them had to be rebaptized. Also in Acts 15 at the Jerusalem Council, when the circumcision party was causing a lot of problems, they finally had to come up with a few commitments, such as refraining from all sexual immorality and from abstaining from blood. There is a trend that is sadly creeping into the Seventh-day Adventist Church to baptize before teaching. It may also come as a desire to have more baptisms quickly. It also assumes that the word baptize and teach in Matthew 28 were intended to be put in a certain order, when in reality they were to complement each other and go hand in hand with each other. This trend to baptize before teaching, in my estimation, is antithetical to our baptismal vows as Seventh-day Adventists and the caution that comes down through us through the prophet Hosea. My people are destroyed from lack of what? Knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you as my priests. Because you have ignored the law of God, I will also ignore your children. There's a dangerous movement that has been infiltrating the unique calling and mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's a belief that we aren't even supposed to understand precisely what the Bible really means, and to me, that's a big issue. It's an attack on the clarity of the Scriptures by those who elevate themselves and their outlook and approach in some noble reality. They've finally risen to say, you know what? We're honest enough that we can tell you that we don't really know what the Bible really means. We can't be certain about everything that the Bible says. We are, we're the true spiritual ones. In my estimation, this type of thinking takes the form an overtone of spiritual pride. My dear brothers and sisters who are gathered here at this 2024 Evangelism Impact, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, I urge you to proceed with great caution and not integrate this kind of misguided direction in the soul-winning initiatives that we are striving to prayerfully advance in North and South Carolina. Paul's counsel to young Timothy is worthy for our consideration. Preach the what? Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires. 
because they have itching ears. They will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you, be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. God's messenger to his end-time church penned these precious words of counsel to each of us. The path of men who are placed as leaders is not an easy one. But they are to see in every difficulty a call to prayer. Never are they to fail of consulting the great source of all wisdom. Strengthened and enlightened by the master worker, they will be enabled to stand firm against unholy influences and to discern right from wrong and good from evil. Treating evangelism as a necessary part of discipleship helps to grow mature disciples, and it is absolutely necessary if we seek to move the vast majority of Adventist churches in North America that are either declining or plateau churches that Pastor Ricardo Palacios referenced, and to make them vibrant as growing and multiplying churches. Just look at this sad picture of yellow and orange churches that he also shared with you just a little while ago. This was a picture of how our Carolina churches look like just before the pandemic years that began in 2020. In 1919, at that time, only 24% of the churches in the Carolina Conference were identified as growing or multiplying. But because of the emphasis on discipleship and the emphasis on evangelism that has taken place here, look at what has happened in just three years. In three years, that percentage significantly grew and more than doubled to 53% that are considered growing or multiplying churches in the Carolina. It is time for us to earnestly and prayerfully consecrate our hearts and, and our witness to the power of the latter rain revival so that we can eliminate all the yellow and orange churches and honor Christ's calling to be green and blue churches that are growing and multiplying. I pray for the day when there will not be one single church or company of the 178 churches and companies that we have, not one of them will report zero as their soul winning record for the year. How is that possible? We can experience the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit when our hearts are more inclined to spend time in earnest prayer than to watch television comedians. We can expect to witness a mighty revival across the Carolinas when we are more interested in our morning devotional time than in the evening sports. Next Sunday is Super Bowl Sunday. And I'm wondering how many of us are going to spend more time watching the Super Bowl than our time alone with God in that morning. If you had zero baptisms last year, you know, we need to be praying about that. You know, we will experience, you know, the amazing power of God when we purposely commit ourselves to avoid clogging our minds and our brains so that we cannot discern the voice of the Holy Spirit. We will experience the amazing transformation that is focused on the spotless robe of Christ's righteousness rather than the fads and the fashions that are distractions of the enemy by God's children. Tyler Long, who is the personal ministries director in the Washington Conference, he didn't mince any words when he wrote this. The results you're getting in your churches is because your systems are designed for that outcome. If you had zero baptisms last year, your systems are perfectly designed for that outcome. Scripture suggests that a healthy church lives and breathes through a love relationship with Jesus. In John, the 13th chapter and verse 35, it was Jesus himself who gave us the 11th commandment. He said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, and that you love one another. By this, by this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Our church exists to be God's presence in the world, 
teaching people to become followers who are in a relationship with Christ and with one another. Yes, I believe in the proclamation of the biblical truths that we hold, but if we neglect the primacy of having a loving relationship with Jesus, we will become malnourished in our walk with Christ. In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set aside. On them is shining wonderful light from the Word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages. There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. The most solemn truths ever entrusted to mortals have been given to us to proclaim to the world. In a world where so many things that compete for our attention, discipleship, making evangelism must be first and foremost to encourage a personal relationship with Jesus for every follower. I thank God for the pastors, the volunteer lay pastors, the lay leaders, the elders, and members of our 178 churches and companies who have helped make 2023 another banner year in evangelism. For the fifth time in the history of this conference, we have reached another milestone of having raised over a million dollars in free will offerings primarily dedicated just for the purpose of evangelism. By God's blessings and provisions, we've held an average of a million dollars in giving for evangelism for the past six years. And for the second time in the history of this conference, we exceeded over a thousand souls in baptism and professions of faith. Dear friends, this is, this is not just a show of numbers. It's a moment of praise in the same way that the early church rejoiced as the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Just look at these numbers that you see. We crossed the threshold to over 26,000 members in the Carolinas this year. Uh, we have 178 churches and companies, 172 churches and three, uh, 36 companies, 34 organized groups, 20 schools, and 1,093 that came in and joined the Adventist family this year. Perhaps we will never realize this side of heaven, the impact of this little book and how it has guided both our established members and new members in a closer walk with Jesus. It's a wonderful joy to experience and welcome to our Carolina church family the newest family members who've joined us by baptism of a profession of faith. I want to encourage you, if you, haven't, if you don't know this yet, if, uh, if any member in your church was baptized between uh, after May of 2019 to 2023, we welcome them to an event that is going to be planned at Masoka Pines Ranch called Welcome to the Family. And uh, uh, it's uh, during the weekend of April 26 to 28. It's a great joy to the heart of the Savior to see these new believers walk faithfully and lovingly as disciples and disciple makers. So if, you're, uh, if you know of anyone that is in that category, invite them to come and join. Uh, and we would love to have them as part of this very special weekend that is being planned. If you've not taken the time to utilize the discipleship handbook in your churches, it's never too late. I urge you to ask for this book and utilize it with small groups or with prayer meeting settings. The Carolina Conference is committed to making sure that this is not something that any church has to worry about expenses. We will cover the cost of getting those books to your churches. We've gone through the entire book in the, uh, with our office staff family, and just this month, actually, I'm sorry, in uh, January, it's February already, uh, we finished the book with our executive committee. I believe that when prayerfully utilized, this book can create a deeper commitment and calling among our members in their walk with Christ. When our time comes to a close this weekend at Myrtle Beach, I'd like to ask us to pray for four things that will sweep across the Carolinas with the power of the Holy Spirit. One, I want you to pray that our churches will place an emphasis on a personal experience in our connection and our relationship with God. Number two, I'm going to ask you to pray that we will be gracious in giving God the time to transform the life of every believer. 
This isn't easy in a world of fast food expectations or instant responses and quick fixes. It's all about waiting on the Lord. In his perfect time, we can be confident that he who has begun a good work in us will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Pray that as we develop nurturing companions in each of our churches, that that will serve as those one-on-one -on -one mentors and models leading toward inward change. Fourth and finally, I'd like you to pray that our discipleship-making evangelism across Carolina will focus on both a loving relationship with Jesus and an active joining in God's mission by understanding their spiritual giftedness, their purpose, and how actively to live out God's calling in the world. That's why you're here. Not just for a feel-good experience of listening to great speakers and, 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 and great presentations and seminars, but to ask God to guide you in how you can be active in joining God's mission to understand your spiritual giftedness, your purpose, and how you can actively live out God's calling in the world. Albert Schweitzer, a German theologian who won the Nobel Peace Prize actually in, in um, the year 1952 for his philosophy on the reverence of life, once said this, there are only three ways to teach a child. The first is by example. The second is by example. And the third is by example. As your servant leader for the Lord here in the Carolinas, I pray that Jesus will captivate your hearts and guide your life as you commit your life to be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. May God bless us in the sacred calling that he has given each of us in his mission. Good morning. Uh, we're bringing back these three presenters so that you can ask additional questions. And uh, we want you to make your way to the microphone here in the center. If you have questions for any of them, feel free to direct your question to a single presenter or to the group as a whole. Um, I've got a, a couple of questions here to, to prime the pump. So I'm going to start with you, Beth. How can someone learn more about MomCo? I will see you this afternoon next door in the Seaview C C C View room at 4 o'clock. And I will walk you through. I will tell you all the details. So please join me. All right. Very good. Thank you. Ricardo, the statistics that you shared, what, uh, what is the source of those statistics and how are they processed? Who processes them? Yes, um, the, those statistics are given by the North American Division. There is, uh, the office is called E-Adventist. Brian Ford is a director and he's been collecting information for the last, I don't know, 20 years probably. And uh, the information comes directly from uh, the churches, you know, that provide year by year uh, their baptisms, attendance, and things like that. Yeah. So it's dependent on the local church then to give accurate information. That's correct. That's why it's so important for the clerics in your churches, especially in the area of attendance. 
yeah, to provide either uh, every 15 years or ideally every week, you know, just yes, to send that information. I believe that today the clerics have access in the Adventist to provide that uh, attendance. So they can enter that directly from their computer? That's correct. Excellent. And that is then forwarded to e-Adventist and, and Brian Ford and That's his right. team? Yes. Okay. Uh, Elder Louie, would you define for us disciple-making evangelism? You use that term in your presentation. You know, people are drawn to the truth when we present the message. Uh, because the truth comes directly from God's word, and people are drawn to that. But it is love that connects a person to uh, the church and to the family of the church. You can bring people in, but if they embrace the truth, but they don't have a connection with people, uh, they, something becomes very dry, and it, it just becomes knowledge. And so that knowledge becomes internalized when we actually focus on how, and that's one of the things that we're hoping to do this year, is um, we will be creating some guidelines and some suggestions for churches to follow in developing what we call these nurturing companions. Because as we bring people into the church, it's their connection. You know, uh, I remember once when a pastor had an evangelistic series of meetings, and after the meetings were over, some of the newest members that were baptized in the church were put immediately to work teaching Sabbath school classes. They didn't say, well, you need to wait for four or five years before you can do that uh, and become more acclimated to the culture of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In fact, one of the members who was really, who had the gift of teaching was immediately put into teaching the Bible study classes for the new believers. So here's a, here's a new believer that was just baptized. He's teaching the class for the new believers. So I believe that making sure that those people are engaged and connected and actively involved will make them much stronger in their love for Jesus and their love for one another. Amen. I, I've heard it said that a true disciple is a disciple maker. That's right. That's right. Beth, back to you for a question. Um, how, do, how do people in the community learn about MomCo and what you're doing? What, what steps do you take? How does it happen? Well, a lot of it is word of mouth because when you're connected to something, you're going to share it. And when you are being fulfilled in something, you're going to share it. And so a lot of the people that have been coming, it's because of word of mouth. But also, we do have um, on our website, on the church website, we do advertise the ministry. And we also have, we, we really utilize um, like Facebook and Instagram and all of that because, I mean, our mothers are, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s. Uh, so that has been a huge advertisement for them. Um, but also, you know, when, when different churches, because I think we're the only Adventist church in the Orlando area that has started this, um, other churches have called me and said, hey, Beth, I want to start this in our church, which is fabulous. Um, it's such a need. And when somebody's looking for something, they're going to search for it, you know. So if you join the MomCo, you'll be in the Google search, you know, so people, people will be able to find you. Very good. Now, I want those of you who are in the, in the audience here, please feel free. If you have a question, step forward to the mic. Um, Ricardo, how does a church become involved with the Center for Community Development that you described? Um, as I mentioned, I'll be very happy to help any of you who is interested in answering some questions, but um, the pastor reaches out to us at the conference, and then we put them in contact with Ignacio Goya, who is the director, and then after that, he continues communicating directly with the pastor and the church uh, to help them in a three-year process. Yeah, and so that's, that's what we like about that. That's what administration really enjoy, is that it's not just a one visit 
or a one weekend thing. It's a commitment for three years. We work with, uh, to work with the pastors, the churches, to help them get more involved, actively involved in the life of their communities. Moving a little deeper, yes. um, what are the financial commitments or, or responsibilities? Yes, uh, the financial commitments are the Center for Community Change charges $10,000 for those three years. We are asking the churches to only share 3,000 of that. The conference is uh, covering one third of that, and the union and the division have a plan where you can apply for funding for revitalization so that you get funding from there. All right. And how many more spots are uh, open for that? I mean, uh, at this moment, there are four. Elder Louis, all right, so we want to uh, start with 10, see how that goes. But if anybody else is interested, I'll be happy to, to, to work with you and to provide additional information in other ways uh, to accomplish a similar thing. But again, this, this plan is all really designed to move people from those declining and plateauing churches into those growing and multiplying churches. That's the intent of this, and to give them guidance and some direction in, in, uh, in, in things that can happen in those local churches that can move them in that direction. Now, Elder Louis, um, what step would you recommend? Oh, I, I thank you for keeping me on track here. At the mic, please state your name and your church and your question. I'm working is dead I uh, check check Mike oh good very good thank you um, my questions to the panel member can you hear me hello hello okay I'll just hold it um, what I meant to say was Church growth is a very popular topic among the clergy and the church leadership. But it is interesting to know that the discussions focus more on achieving growth rather than the type of growth. The church growth guru, Donald McGraven, gave three types of church growth. We know the first one is uh, the biological growth. Like I have three boys that are my church members, so it's a church growth. But more than that, we are also experiencing the transfer growth. The transfer growth focuses more on people church hopping or coming to another church, believing that they get more important um, recognition or whatever they're in the church. And this transfer growth is something that we experience when the movement of people from one congregation is drawing away or is lessening the uh, growth of the other church. And we can see also transfer growth in the case of uh, the great influx of immigrations and also people drawn from other countries to this church or to this country. And the growth, the type of growth that I would like to focus more is on the conversion growth. The conversion growth is when a person, he or she, finds Jesus. And then they embrace Jesus Christ and they stay in the church. So when the church, early church, faced persecution in Acts chapter 8, except for the disciples, apostles, the members scattered all over Judea, Samaria, and all over the then known world, right? And we know that there was a spontaneous church growth because in Acts chapter 8, verse 4, the Bible says that those scattered abroad carried the gospel message. And that's the reason why we see 3,000 church growth, 5,000 church growth, and eventually the book of Acts did not try to compute it. They said 
both multitudes of men and women, including from the priestly class, were converted. So I see that the church growth works best when not only the pastors, but the church members, each and every one of us, take takes the gospel message with spontaneity, we go and spread it. It's not just the preacher preaching from the pul pulpit, but each member's spontaneity in spreading the gospel brings a conversion growth. So the conversion growth we see in Acts, the book of Acts is not, I know there must definitely be a biological growth or a transfer growth from Rome or from Jerusalem, whatever. But the Bible did say that they were converted. Yeah. It was a conversion growth. So my question here is on top of what the pastors are doing with their church board members and preaching from the pulpit, is there a way like here in this meeting or at the camp meeting where the conference will address this spontaneity type of church planting or church growth to educate all the church members or who comes to the camp meeting so that the gospel message can be taken to everywhere by the members because pastor can convert with great Bible studies, maybe about five people. But if I have 10 members bringing one member in a year, there will be 15 plus 10, 15, uh, 10 plus 15, 20. If I have 100 members bringing in one member in a year, it will be 200 members. And so is there a way to create this spontaneity upon the, uh, the lay church members so that we will see one more time like the explosion, the exponential growth that the early church experienced? And also, the Bible did say, Apostle Paul here continued uh, to tell regarding the church growth in Colossians chapter 1, verse 3, 23, that the gospel message was preached to every creature under heaven. And that was because of the lay people who took the gospel message. So is there a way to create more thirst and hungers upon the lay members so that there will be an exponential growth that will grow ex more exponentially in the church. Thank you. Thank you. Pastor Cornelius, I think this is uh, one of the reasons why we have a, a variety of different, it's not just one thing, but the, the key word here is volume. The volume of uh, uh, training sessions, the volume of equipping, uh, the volume of the number of activities that are involved. In other words, not everybody has the gift of necessarily going out and preaching an evangelistic campaign, but there are people that have the gift of hospitality. There are people that have, and utilizing all of those, and I think focusing on that and, and really making it a matter of prayer. I, I think in our church boards, uh, how much time is spent in a church board actually focusing on evangelism and soul winning? We spend a lot of time on other issues that are connected with the, the mechanics and the operation of the church. But I would say that the lion's share of a church board meeting should be focused on evangelism and soul winning and what, what can be done and exploring that and, and taking time actually to spend time in prayer, in deep prayer and asking the Lord to impress upon our hearts what we can do uh, as a church. That may be through lit literature distribution. We are partnering right now with a ministry called Streams of Light to get literature out you know, uh, to homes, uh, rather than just mail outs, actually going to a home, maybe praying for a home. So there are many, many different facets, and it's, it's the volume of activity that can take place guided by prayer and uh, a deep uh, understanding of the mission of the church and and that understanding is created when the leadership of the church comes together and says this is what is our priority and and focusing on it thank you Elder Louis. i believe another important um foundational change of mindset is what the role of the pastor is the role of the pastor is to train equip and mobilize lay people 
And, and, and I think that is a foundational shift that needs to take place once we see the pastor as a trainer, an equipper, and a mobilizer, then we understand that all the members are the ones who are being trained, mobilized to accomplish the mission. I think that's, that's a foundational change of mindset also in, that needs to take place in our churches. And I would mention that at, at a camp meeting was referenced, there is a specific seminar each year that is geared toward training members to take part in this uh, outreach because you are correct. It will not be finished by pastors alone. It must be everyone who is a member. Everyone is ordained to be a missionary. Yes, at the, at the mic as a person, please share your name and now church. I am applying to become a member of this church. Uh, uh, Do I need to hold this? It, okay. Yes, thank you. Okay, please bear with me. <laughs> I am deaf. And so everybody has languages. <laughs> and, quite, and I am do, been in there applying to become a member of the church for three months now. <laughs> and it's a lot of uh, uh, awesome experience for me because I've been born again since I'm 15. Okay? And I have been members of different kinds of denominations. Being that, it's been taking a little bite and chewing on it and then experiencing it. <laughs> and, I'm, and what I'm seeing, I'm a, a mom, four kids, 15 grandkids, eight, I just had my eighth great grandchild. And it has not been a perfect walk, but we have a perfect God. And what I'm seeing in all these changes and the different things that I've seen from one, de from one decade to another and being deaf, Believe me, I'm watching. <laughs> I'm watching and praying. I have to. And I have to tell you, I've gone through a lot, which we don't need to get into. It's past. But the thing I'm seeing what's going on in the world today, and I'm, I'm able to watch things on TV, on the Internet, and get a variety. I say, Lord, what's next? And he will cause me to watch things and to learn things that I don't want to know. Now, all of us want to protect, right? But if you don't know the enemy, if you don't know the enemy, you, we lose. And that's my experience. Did and so my question is this. What I'm seeing that is weak, at least in my life, that I'm working with the Holy Spirit on to correct, is the way we pray. It's about how do we come together in our own personal lives, and as a corporate, the church, how do we pray to, to fight the good fight of faith? You know, we we never. It doesn't matter how much studying you do, how many memories you do, what groups of friends you have, or even the programs you have in the church. If we don't pray effectively, it's not going to happen. Would. Would you like to answer that? And I see this Elder? in all the denominations. And that's, that's the situation that I'm seeing. And I've been a deacon's wife. I've been before I lost all my hearing. I've been a deacon's wife. I worked on hospitalities. I was a foster child. I had a youth group. <laughs> I've been a Sunday school teacher. And I like the 33-year-olds the best. <laughs> okay? But the situation is... We are not praying effectively. And, I, and I, I've been to two different Bible college because you told me to go. I didn't finish it, and everybody, I'm getting condemned because I don't finish anything I start. And I said, Lord, forgive me. He said, no, no, no. I don't want you to finish it. I'm finishing it. He's finishing it. So how do we do that? Elder Louis, would, or, or Beth, were you... Okay. Would you like to answer that? Yeah. And I we're going to need to we're going to need to wrap up. I've gotten the time time signal. So, I think one of the things uh, that you mentioned several times in what you shared was the in the power of prayer, and it is it is by praying and asking for God's direction and earnestly seeking God's guidance and direction that He will 
he will open up to your eyes you know, the gifts that he has given you that you can use in your witness for him and how you can live for him. And I, I, you know, none of us have all the answers, but all of us have a connection with the one who does have all the answers. I want to thank each of you. We've gotten the signal that, that our time is up for our panel, so we're going to need to, to transition to our next program. But thank you each for participating. And um, if you'd like to speak with one of the panel members personally, we would, uh, we would welcome your speaking with them. And we're going to, to transition now to prepare for the worship service. And let me just mention that in, if there are any seats in your, in your row, please consolidate so that those who are coming in will have a place to sit. There is also some overflow in the Sea View room. So thank you. Thank you, each of you uh, panel members, for your sharing, and uh, we will continue here momentarily.
they have to have your attention just a moment. I do have individuals that will be coming in that you will see. I see a number of seats here near the front. But if you are on the road where there are vacant seats, if you will press toward the middle so that those who are coming in don't have to fight over you to get to our seats. Please make it uh, convenient for the individuals coming in from the other units. Thank you. Good morning. Yep. Check, check. Good morning. Oh. Check. There you are. Check. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. I'd like you to join with us as we sing a few songs together, sure. starting out with Bless the Lord, 10,000 Reasons. Sure. Hold on a second. Joe, there's no, it's nothing in our ears from that. Really? Okay, now I'm ready. We'll get this right here in a minute. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again, whatever Forever, forever, 
Join with us as we sing the days of Elijah.
We've been learning a new song here this week at Evangelism Impact. It's called New Name Written Down in Glory. And I pray that as we sing this song, you will um, identify with your name being written down in glory. Oh 
Good morning and happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters in Christ. Buenos dias y feliz sábado, hermanos y hermanas in Cristo. And all the way from around the world, Sando Shamana Oibunal. That's from India. <laughs> Happy Sabbath, everyone. We are so glad that you are here, worshiping with us here at the largest Carolina event. This is larger than camp meeting because when we have our camp meeting at Lake Junaluska, most of the people that come there are half from Carolina and half from Georgia Cumberland Conference. But this is the largest Carolina event. On behalf of Elder Glenn Altermatt, our evangelism director, Elder Haskell Williams, our ministerial director, Elder Daryl Bentley, our associate ministerial director, and Elder Ricardo Palacios, our Hispanic ministries director, I welcome you to our 2024 evangelism impact here at Myrtle Beach. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us be glad and rejoice in it. May God bless you as we worship him on this Sabbath day. It is our privilege to come together as a congregation before our God. He sits enthroned on high and he delights to hear the prayer of his people. Let us bow our heads together as we speak to our Lord. Heavenly Father, it would be audacious for us to claim an audience with you except that you have told us that you delight to receive us. And so we come together as a congregation, your congregation, Lord, representing many of the churches across the Carolinas and even beyond. And we know that there are many who are in churches across this conference and perhaps beyond who right now are worshiping you. And you are able to receive each prayer, even the prayers of our heart that are unspoken. We worship you, Lord. You are mighty. You are also gracious, and we thank you, God, because we come to you as those who need your grace, your strength, your forgiveness. We delight that you have called us sons and daughters of God. We come as the prodigal son, undeserving, but delighted with your embrace. We worship you, Lord. As we come, there are many things that are on our hearts, things that we've brought from during the week, things that have happened, needs we have encountered, healing that we desire. You know where those, those needs for healing are. We lift them up before you, dear Lord. We ask Jesus that you mingle the incense of your prayer with our prayers as they come before your, your throne, O God. As we meet, draw our hearts together in the purpose that you have given to us to reach a world with the hope that you give. O oh Lord, that is impossible in our strength. Thank you for promising your Holy Spirit, and we ask that you send him on our hearts, in our midst. May this upper room be as effectual in reaching our community as the upper room in Jerusalem, O oh Lord. If need be, send the tongues of fire upon us. Do what you need to do in us so that we are effective witnesses for you. One day soon, Lord, we look to see you coming from across the, the, the Atlantic, the, your 
bright clouds shining with angelic glory and the glory of the Father. We await that day. Help us to do what is needed to share the great love you have for humanity in our homes, in our communities, in our workplaces. That that day may come soon. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. It's a blessing to be in the house of the Lord, amen? amen? Many times in this country, when we think of sacrifice, there might be two things that come to mind. If you come from a military background, perhaps you think of sacrifice in terms of the lives that have been given on the battlefield to give us the freedoms that we enjoy. This morning, I want to praise God for the freedoms we have to worship. What do you say? But if we apply that also to a Christian context, perhaps sacrifice appropriately draws our minds to the price that Jesus paid on Calvary that you and I might have victory over sin, and I especially want to praise God for the sacrifice of my Jesus. Amen? Amen. And then sometimes we as Christians erroneously, falsely tell people that sacrifice ended at the cross, and that's simply not true. I draw your minds to the book of Romans, chapter 12, in verse 1. The Apostle Paul writes, and this is from the New American Standard Bible. He says, therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, maybe you remember the next part, a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. And I love the last part where it says, which is your spiritual service of worship. In other words, if you and I claim to embrace the sacrifice of Jesus for ourselves, then we're also agreeing that we will give our lives sacrificially to our God. How many of us understand that this morning and want to say, Amen, Lord? Amen. I also want to commend you and say thank you for the sacrificial giving that you have done in your local churches for our evangelism budget. Do you recognize what an amazing thing it is for a conference to raise over a million dollars apart from returning tithe, apart from giving local offerings to sustain your local churches, it's an amazing and wonderful thing for a conference to also raise over a million dollars for evangelism. And I wanna praise God this morning for that. How about you? But this morning we have another opportunity. Maybe you saw, sitting in your seat, these little envelopes. And I want you, if you have that envelope, take it and look in the inside with me. You'll see just inside the flap, there's an opportunity to return a thank offering this morning. Or maybe you're new to this understanding of giving to evangelism. And now that you understand that we really believe in evangelism in Carolina, maybe you want to be a part of those ongoing partners who regularly contribute to evangelism here in Carolina. There's an opportunity for you to do that. Some of you might be a little more technologically advanced, and you say, I don't want to write my information on an envelope. I'd like a little bit more secure portal. Well, you're blessed in that you can go to either your local church's Adventist online giving, or you can visit carolinasda.org. You can go to Generous Living, then click on Adventist Giving Online, and you can also give ongoing funds to evangelism that right there on Adventist Giving. But this morning, we are going to collect an offering. I've placed my offering in my envelope, so I'm going to return mine this morning. And I want to share just one other verse with you, actually two, from the book of Psalms. And this comes from Psalm 50. Beginning in verse 5, notice the call of the psalmist this morning. The Lord says through the psalmist, gather my godly ones to me. The saints, I don't know about you, but when I look in the mirror, I don't naturally think I'm a godly one. But then I remember I belong to Jesus. And because I'm covered by the blood of Christ, I can be considered godly and righteous because of what Jesus has done. Amen? So gather my godly ones to me. 
those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And I'm going to skip down to verse 23 of Psalm 50. And notice how it finishes. He who offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me. And to him who orders his way aright, I shall show the salvation of God. This morning, saints, I would like to offer myself afresh to the Lord Jesus Christ. How about you? And I'd also, if, you're, if you came prepared and would like to give an offering this morning, you say, well, Pastor, what is this offering specifically for? As you may recall, there was no cost to register for the Evangelism Impact event just for your accommodations and travel to come here. So this morning's offering will help us offset the cost of hosting this event. You'll notice at the end of your rows, those of you who are sitting along the middle aisle, look down if you will, find the bucket down by your seat. There's one at the end of each row, and I'm going to have a prayer. There's one up here at the front of these rows as well, so just get, grab those buckets. I'm going to offer a word of prayer, and then after I pray, if you will take those buckets and just pass them across your row, we have deacons prepared to receive them. But let's pause for a word of prayer, and let's ask God to bless the sacrificial giving. Pray with me, please. Loving Father, Lord, we want to say thank you. Lord, we recognize thank you is a very small thing, but yet, Lord, it's all we have to express our gratitude in words. We want to thank you for blessing this conference. We want to thank you for the saving knowledge of a relationship with Jesus Christ. Father, we want to thank you for sustaining our livelihoods, for giving us gainful employment giving us a way to take care of our families, to support our local churches, and yes, to be able to give back a little bit this morning. So Father, as we take these means that belong to you, because we're reminded that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, we don't own anything. It all belongs to you, Lord. So Father, we return these offerings this morning, and we ask that you would bless them, that you would multiply them. Perhaps they're like the fish and loaves of a little boy, Lord, and when that offering was given out, everyone had eaten. There were 12 baskets gathered up because you blessed that little offering. So, Lord, take this offering today and bless it according to your divine will. We ask these mercies and these blessings in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, saints. Would you stand with us as we sing about our maker being the way maker?
I worship you. I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here. Touching every heart, I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, turning lives. continue here with our worship and sing what a beautiful name. I hope that you realize this morning that Jesus is the sweetest name that we know, right? Um, if he's not, I hope he becomes that today for you. You were the word of the beginning one with God, the Lord Most High. You're hidden in glory in creation. Now revealed in you are Christ. Sing 
what a beautiful name. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You did it one ever without us. So Jesus, you.
Jose Cortez Jr., alongside his cherished wife Joanne and their family of two sons, finds profound joy in ministry. With nearly 25 years of experience in church leadership, Cortez currently serves as Associate Director of the North American Division Ministerial Association. His role encompasses evangelism, church planting, global mission, church growth, and mission to the cities. Please welcome Pastor Jose Cortez. It is so good to be able to be with each and every one of you here on this beautiful Sabbath and to see you again after a few years. Can someone say amen? It's a beautiful Sabbath. And I know that you have been having the best time ever during this week. I know that you have heard from Pastor De Blair Schnell, Pastor Roger Hernandez, Pastor Gerardo Udry, Pastor Richie Halverson, Pastor David uh, Kleindest, uh, among others. I know you heard from Beth, uh, also Beth Grant. And I know that you have been blessed, and I'm praying to God that today will be another day when you can experience the Holy Spirit in this place. Amen? Amen. I must begin by saying that it always gives me great joy. Always gives me great joy to be able to come to the Carolina Conference. Pastor Leslie, uh, I don't know if you know this, but you happen to be the president of one of the most beautiful territories all across North America. Amen? Amen. It's okay to clap. It's all right. It's all right. One of the most beautiful territories. Let me see if I get the beautiful coastline. Ah. Woke up this morning and the sun, it was uh, rising uh, uh, on the ocean, so beautiful. Uh, you, but you also have the great Smoky Mountains, amen? amen. Uh, and the charm of your cities. What beautiful cities in this, in this area. And your sports teams. Let me see if I can get a few of them. You got the Clemson Tigers, amen? amen. All right. The Duke uh, Devil, uh, Blue Devils. I heard a boo over there. That must be coming from one of the Tar Heels, right? Carolina Tar Heels. You got the Carolina Panthers. Ah, we need to pray for them, but hey, all right. Charlotte Hornets. All right, a few people like the Charlotte, the, the Hornets, but I want to say this. I want to make it clear this morning that out of all of these beautiful things that you have in the territory of the Carolinas, What's most beautiful, what God loves most about the Carolinas is not the cities and, and the coastline and, and the beautiful vegetation that you have across your territory or, or the charm of the cities or, or even your sports teams. You know what's most beautiful about the Carolinas? What's most beautiful about all of the Carolinas is you. Ha! You and your neighbors and your friends and your co-workers. And I want to tell you here this morning, God placed you somewhere in North or South Carolina because he wants you to be a blessing to people around you. Can someone say amen? amen. So my dear brother, my dear sister, mi querido hermano, mi querida hermana, it is not a coincidence that you live where you live, that you are where you are. God placed you there because there are people that want to see Jesus, need to see Jesus. And the only way for them to see and to experience Jesus is through you. Amen? Today, I also come to you very grateful. Last time I was here for this event, Carolina Conference Evangelism Impact was 2018. And I remember on that Sabbath, 2018, your president and Glenn Alternat stood up here and they said, we would love to see 1,000 people baptized in the Carolina Conference. And you got close. 800, 900, then the pandemic came and everything went down a little bit or a whole lot. But I want to say thank you to God and thank you 
to each and every one of you. I want to say thank you because the last two years, God has used you to bring over a thousand people to the kingdom of God right here in the Carolina Conference. And I think we need to be grateful for that. Thank you. So Pastor Leslie, Pastor Hasco, Pastor Ricardo Palacio, Pastor Daryl Bentley, and I want to also talk to each and every one of your pastors. Where are the pastors? Can, can the pastors who are here st please stand up? I want to see you. Where are the pastors of the Carolina Conference who are here? Oh, my goodness. I, I see a few of you. All right. Can we give a big hand to our pastors? Thank you. Thank you, pastors, for your loyal and great work. Where are the elders? Where are the elders? Let me see. Where are the elders of our, uh, that are here in the room? Do we have some elders in the room? Can you stand up, please? Can we give a big hand to our elders? All right. Very, very good. Thank you. Uh, let me see. Where are the small group leaders? ¿Dónde están los líderes de grupos pequeños? Can I see the small group leaders? Can you please? Do we have any small group leaders right here? Okay, I see a few. I know it's got to be more than that. Can we give a big hand to our small group leaders? Amen. Ha! And to each and every one of you who has given a Bible study, who has worked hard to bring someone to Jesus, thank you. You're doing what God wants you to do. And it is because of your work that God has blessed this conference so greatly. Amen? Amen. So thank you. And I also have good news. All across the North American division, listen up. This last year, 2023, is a year that we had the most baptisms since 2011. Can someone say amen? amen? And when I talk about baptism, some people may say, may say uh, yeah, Pastor Cortez likes numbers and this and that. Listen up. Each number is a person. Can someone say amen? amen. Each number is a person of someone who, who didn't have Jesus, and now they have Jesus, and now they have hope. So I praise God for each one of the almost 39,000 people that got baptized across North America this year, because these are people who are going with us to heaven. Amen for them. Amen for each and every one of them. Now, I have been asking God to give me something special for you today. And God has been messing with me. Last night I was talking to my friend, Pastor Roger Hernandez, and I said, man, I got three things that God is, hasn't given me clarity. This morning I got up and God gave me another thing. So you bear with me for the next few moments. And I'm going to pray right now that what God has given me for you today blesses you, inspires you, and challenges you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Dear Holy Spirit. I am a sinner. I do not deserve to be used by you. As a matter of fact, each and every one of us here today, we are all sinners. And Jesus, is, if it wasn't for your sacrifice and for your grace and for your mercy, which is new every morning, none of us would be here today. So, Spirit, I'm placing myself in your hands. And I'm asking you to use me. You've used me in the past. Use me again. Use me with power. I pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Pastor Tony Campolo, a retired Baptist preacher, in one of his books, told a very interesting story. He found himself in the city of Honolulu, Hawaii. He had arrived that night, uh, gone to sleep, and woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning. You know, if you are from the East Coast in the United States like we are here right now, and, and, you, uh, and you wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning in Hawaii, that means that it's probably 9 o'clock right here. It's between 5 and 6 hours difference depending on the time. So he said it felt like it was 9 o'clock in the morning, but it was 3 a.m. And he said, and I was starving. 
I was so hungry. I was starving. I needed to eat something. So he says that he will, uh, as, as, uh, got up from his bed, put on some clothes, and wander into the streets of Honolulu to see if he could find a place where he can get some breakfast. Ah, uh, three o'clock in the morning. He says that everything on the main streets was clo uh, closed. Close, close, close. So he said, I, I, I realized that the main streets, the restaurants in the main street were, not, uh, were all closed. So I wondered and I got, I ventured myself into the, into the secondary streets of the city. The alleys. It was dark. And he says that as he was walking, uh, he saw all of a sudden, he saw some neon lights and he could read N. So he said, that must mean open. That must mean open, you know, just that the, a few of the lights are off, you know. And as he got to it, he noticed that it, it was like a very small place. He calls it a, calls it a very a greasy, sleazy, uh, you know, one of those diners, uh, holes in the wall. You know what I'm talking about? I know they don't have anything like here, right here in Carolina. They don't have that. <laughs> he went through the door, and there was no one there. With the exception of the person that he calls, he calls him. That's not me doing that. It's him in the book. You can read the book. He calls him the fat guy behind the counter. <laughs> His name, Harry. He walks in. There were no tables or anything. It was just like a bar with stools. He sat on one of them and he said, I did not even want to touch the, the, the counter, the bar with my hands because it, it felt so greasy. It didn't feel, you know, so, so I did not even look at the menu because uh, uh, the moment I looked at the menu, it seemed that, that, that if I grabbed it, some kind of strange creature was going to crawl out of it. And he said, but I was so hungry that I needed to order something, so I just ordered a donut. And we're here in an Adventist gathering, so I'm going to say a donut with a hot chocolate. Amen? Ha! <laughs> he says that he knows that in the back, back room, donuts fall on the floor all the time and they get kicked. And he says, I know that in the back room, stuff like that happens. But I would have appreciated if Harry at least would have used some, something to grab the donut with. And he says, the, the fat guy behind the counter just grabbed the donut with his hands. Not even a napkin or anything. And, and put, it, put it on the counter. And he says, I started munching on my donut with my hot chocolate. Ha, uh, and just as he was beginning to eat his donut with chocolate, wondering if God could even bless that at that time of the night, the doors of the, of the sleazy, greasy place opened up again. And in walked five ladies. Ladies of the night, could we say? He could tell that these ladies were uh, the ladies that were awake at that time of the night because they, they were making a living out of the nightlife. It was five prostitutes. Today, they will call them sex workers. And since the place is so small, two of them sat on one side of him and the other three sat on the other side, only six chairs all together. And, and he says that they began to talk past him. And by now he's saying, I wonder what my church members would think if they saw me at 3 o'clock in the morning in this leasy, greasy place, uh, sitting and eating a donut with hot chocolate with five prostitutes. <laughs> would Jesus approve of this? Ah. And the one to his right, he said, hey guys, you know something? Tomorrow is my birthday. And the one to his left said, and what do you want us to do, Agnes? Her name was Agnes. What do you want us to do? Do you want us to throw you a party? To which Agnes replied, she said, no one has ever thrown me a birthday party before, so, so why would I want that? 
After 15 minutes, the break was over. The five ladies got up and left. And when I tell you this story, I can think of another story that I find in my Bible. It is also in your Bible, and I want us to go right there to our Bibles right now for a moment. To the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verses 3 and 5, and it says there, listen up, this is very important. John 4, 3 and 5, and it says there, so Jesus left Judea. Listen up. Jesus left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Jesus had to go from Judea, Jerusalem, to Galilee. Verse 4. Now, listen up. He had to go. It doesn't say that, that he... It doesn't say that he preferred to go. It doesn't say that, that he... It says he had to go. There is an imperative. He had to go through... Where? Help me out. Samaria. Verse 5. So he came to a town in Samaria called what? Sikar. Near the plot of ground Jacob had given... To his son Joseph. If you begin to dig deeper into this uh, piece of scripture, this passage that I just read, that we just read together, you can see a tremendous amount of significance in what Jesus is doing here. If you were to go from Jerusalem to Galilee, there were two different ways, two different highways, two different ways you could go. The shortest one is this one, going through Samaria. But interestingly enough, it's the one that the Jewish never took as they went from, from, from Jerusalem to Galilee. Guess why? Why? Because the Jewish didn't like the Samaritans. Because the Samaritans were not pure enough. The Samaritans did not pray in the same way. The Samaritans worshipped differently. The Samaritans were not the sons and daughters of just uh, Jewish people. They were not the, the pure descenders, descendants of Abraham. They were mixed with the Assyrians and others. Therefore, the Jewish disliked, and we could even say hated, the Samaritans. And my first point that I want you to get here today is that Jesus goes out of his way to get to the people that we don't like. Can someone say amen here today? Ah! Who are the people that you don't like? Can I go a little further? Who are the people that the church doesn't like? Close your eyes for a moment. Think of the person you don't like. Now think about the people your church doesn't like. Think about the people who have left the church because they were mistreated, because they were not liked. Open your eyes again. People who are not loved by the church People who are not liked by the church, the people who are rejected by the church, these people are still loved by Jesus. Can someone say amen? amen. Ah, Jesus goes out of his way to get to the people that the church doesn't get to. Is that clear, church? Are we, are we on the same page? Who is that person that you don't like? Jesus loves them. Ah. Who is that lady that you cannot stand? Jesus loves her. Amen. Your neighbor, the one that has a dog that makes noise at night. Ah. Who is that? Jesus loves your neighbor. Amen. 
The guy that goes and smokes and, 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 and next to you at the work site. And you're always looking at him funny because you wish he wasn't doing that. You know what? Jesus loves him too. Can someone say amen? amen. The young man, the young woman who is struggling with this and, and her sexuality. And we don't know how to explain it. But they are still there and we don't like it. You know what? Jesus loves her. Jesus loves him too. Amen. amen. Some of you are looking at me seriously. But it's a reality. The Bible says that it was necessary. He had to. It does not say that Jesus decided to go that route because it was the shortest way, uh, because it was convenient for him. The Bible says that it was necessary for Jesus to go through Samaria. But not only did he go through Samaria, he went through the city of Sychar. Question. What does that mean? My brother Gerardo Udry, he, he loves biblical languages. And he can speak them and, and read them and all of that. I, I, I have to go to the tools sometimes. But I went and I looked it up in the original language. What does Sikar mean? You know what the name of that city means? City of drunkards. So here we have Pastor Hernandez. We have Jesus. The pure son of God. Jesus who is God. The creator. The perfect. The one who has never seen. You have Jesus going through Samaria. But not only through Samaria. You have Jesus going through the city of drunkards. Why would Jesus, the perfect, the pure, the creator, the redeemer. Why would Jesus go through, through the city of drunkards? Because Jesus goes, and listen to me, my brothers and sisters. Jesus goes wherever there is pain, wherever there is addiction, wherever there is suffering, wherever there is divorce, wherever there, is, uh, 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 there are addictions, wherever there is disease, wherever there is death, wherever there is crying, wherever there is tears, Jesus goes there because Jesus came to this earth to love and to seek and to save those who are lost, those who are suffering. Can someone say amen? Ah, that's the reason why Jesus went to the city of drunkards. But if we keep reading, let's keep reading very quickly. There is something else that happens. Verse 6 and 7. And Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. And it was about noon. And at that time, a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Very quickly. Who is this woman? She's a Samaritan? She's a woman? None of those two things were pro, uh, pros, were things that were in your favor, that worked in your favor at that time. Especially if you're in the presence of a Jewish man. She was a Samaritan. She was a woman. She was poor. If she was someone with money, she wouldn't be coming up to get the water. You know, someone would have come to get the water for her. Amen, right? No one was coming to the well to get water at, at midday. That's midday. And midday gets hot over there. Can so, uh, are we on the same page here? So the reason why she's coming in at this time to get water is because she does not want anyone to see her. Because she feels bad about what she does and she feels bad about who she is. Her self-esteem is so low. She knows that people don't like her. And do you know why people don't like her? If we keep reading, we can see the reason why people don't like her. People don't like her because she had had how many husbands? Five. Five. And we're not talking about a divorce culture like the one we have today. It was strange in those days to, to go from one husband to another. to get. It was strange. So this lady had five husbands. And, and, and the one that she is with now is not what? Her husband. Yeah. 
People don't want to see her because she's trouble. Ladies in Sikor, they hate her. So she's also lonely. She's coming to the world feeling far away from God, ashamed. Have you ever felt so far away from God, so ashamed of the things that you do or the things that you have done that you don't even feel like you want to pray? Can I be vulnerable with you today? I am a pastor. I've been in this church since I was born. I, I, I was not born in the church. I was born in the hospital. Hey, <laughs> but, but the moment right after I got out of the hospital, they took me to church. Amen. I hear some people say, no, I was born in church. It's like, no, you were not. Imagine deacons and deaconesses trying to help. No, no, you were not. You were born in the hospital. Been in the church for 51 years. My great-grandmother was an Adventist. My grandmother was an Adventist. My parents are Adventists. My family, we're all Adventists. My kids now are fifth-generation Adventists. And you're like, why is Pastor Jose saying these things? Why is he giving us his resume? I'm trying to boast here. I'm about to say something, that, and I, I want you to get this. I'm a pastor. Not only I'm a pastor, but I, I've been given a responsibility to be part of a team that oversees and, and looks for, uh, out for the welfare of pastors all across North America. 1.2 million members in several countries. 4,300 pastors in nearly 7,000 churches. I've been given a great responsibility. I could say I'm privileged. But even with all of this privilege and with all of this, I am a sinner. Can someone get that clear? I am a sinner. And I wake up every morning needing the mercies of God. Am I making myself clear? There have been days, Pastor Roger, when I wake up. And I feel bad about some things and I, I don't have the desire to pray. This woman is coming to the, to the, to the well, feeling far away from God. And that is the reason why one of my favorite Bible promises in Scripture is the one that says that His mercies are new every morning because we need His mercies new every morning. Amen. Amen. So she's coming to the, to the well feeling that she's really far away from God. And when she gets to the well, God Himself is at the well waiting for her. Can someone say amen to that? Amen. You know why? Because when we feel the furthest from God is when God is closest to us. And you will say, perhaps, Pastor, Pastor, uh, how do you know that? Let me go to a beautiful Bible verse. It's found in Romans 5, 8 that says, But God demonstrates his love for us, for you and for me in this, while we were still sinners, when we didn't have it all together, when we were in bad shape, Christ died for us. Amen. So you know why Jesus went to Sikar? Jesus went to Sikar to the city of drunkards. Because there were drunkards there. Amen? Have you ever said, I'm not going to go there because it's bad? Let's not go there. That's a bad part of town. Jesus runs to the bad part of town because it is bad. Amen? Jesus went to the town, to the city of drunkards, to, to Sikar, because there were drunkards there. Jesus went there because there was a lady there. That had been with five men. And the man that he was, the man that she, she was with and right now was not her husband. Jesus went to the city of Sychar because she was there and he knew that she needed him. Can someone, can someone say amen? Jesus goes to the places where there is a need. Amen. amen. Now as I close, I want to leave two practical tips with you. Because this is about evangelism. What can we learn from the master evangelist Jesus as we read this story? As Seventh-day Adventists, as a remnant of God, as a chosen people, what can we learn from this story? Lesson number one. 
Are you ready? Are you ready? Oh, no, you guys are not ready. Are you ready? Okay, I think some of you are ready, all right? Lesson number one. Never be so holy that you cannot embrace the forgotten, the rejected, and the untouchable as Jesus did. Amen? Why are you guys so quiet? Why, why is the people of God, why, what, why are the people of God so quiet here today? Do you hear what I said? Never be so holy that you cannot embrace the forgotten, the rejected, and the untouchable. That you cannot embrace him like Jesus embraced him. A church that cannot love those who are broken is a broken church. Yeah. Write that down somewhere. Is people still tweet nowadays, Roger? Is people still Twitter still? You're tweeting it? Can, can you please tweet it? It's no longer Twitter. I think it's X or something, right? It's like, it's, I don't know what, the, what they were thinking. A church that cannot love those who are broken is a broken church. Can I go in a little further? A Seventh-day Adventist. Ah, a Seventh-day Adventist that is too holy, too good to love and to embrace those who are broken it's a broken Seventh-day Adventist. Am I making myself clear this morning? Amen. If you are a Seventh-day Adventist and you look at people as if you were better than they are because you have received Jesus and Jesus gave you his grace and you're not willing to give the grace that Jesus gave to you, to them, you're a broken Seventh-day Adventist. Am I making myself clear this morning? I have observed as I travel across North America that in Adventism, and it happens everywhere, I've seen it everywhere, so probably it happens here too, I hope not. There is always one or two everywhere I go. A person who seems to be obsessed about behavior. But usually the obsession with behavior is not about his or her own behavior. It's about the behavior of others. Am I making myself clear? Yeah. Pastor, we want to make sure that they are doing right. Pastor, we, 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 I know you love to preach about the, the love of God, and, and, and that's fine and dandy, and it's, it's, it's kind of soft. You know, we wish that you would uh, go a little bit harder, Pastor. These are people, individuals who, who want everyone else to behave well. But I've noticed that with, with, in some of these cases, they want everybody else to behave well, but they behave bad. <laughs> they want others to walk straight while, while they walk crooked. The other day I was at a camp meeting. And I was preaching something similar to what I'm preaching here today. And, and I had a brother uh, who came after, and he got, he got really close to me. He seemed to be even agitated, Pastor Leslie. I know that doesn't happen here in Carolina. <laughs> and he says, Pastor, you, you, you preach too much about God's love. That's soft food. We need something more solid, Pastor. 
Pastor, uh, please, you know, uh, you got to tell him, uh, go and, and sin no more, Pastor. Uh, Jesus did that. And he got really close to me. And I said to him, that's right. Jesus did that. And he said, Pastor, that's why I've made a, a commitment in my life to just go to people and tell them to sin no more. I had to look at him straight in the eye and said, remember who said it? Jesus said it. The one who said it was one who had never committed a sin. The one who said it is the one who had been standing. This is another woman now. Is the one who had been standing, you know, defending that woman who was about to be stoned by others. And the one who said it, Jesus, for that woman and for those that were going to stone her as well. So I look at him, got closer to him too, and said, next time that you're going to get the gods to go to someone and tell him, go and sin no more, remember this. First of all, make sure that you're without sin. Ah. Number two, number two, make sure that you're willing to defend that person with your life. And number three, make sure that you're willing to die for that, for that person if it was necessary. If you're willing to do all of those three, then you can go out and say, go and sin no more to anybody you want to. Amen. Amen. My second lesson. Before I go to the second lesson, let me tell you what he said. He said, Pastor, but if you're not going to change them, who's going to change them? And I said, thank you for asking. And I went to my Bible to Philippians 1.6. And I read this to him. And I am certain that God... The one who began the good work within you. Ha. He will continue his work in you until it is finally completed. Finish. On the day when Christ Jesus returns. Amen. Your job. Your job back there, my brother. Back there, your job is to love them. Not to fix him. That, that, you could tweet that too. Your love, your job is to love them, not to fix them. So pastor, if I don't fix them, who, uh, the Holy Spirit will fix them. You love, Holy Spirit fixes. You love, Holy Spirit fixes. You know, and, and, and the day of the second coming, when Jesus comes, on that day, we will all be perfect. Amen? Amen. In the meantime, we love and let the Holy Spirit fix people. Amen? Is that, is that good? good? All right, now, tip number two. And now we're really getting ready to land this plane, you know, but hey. Tip number two, never be so holy that other sinners cannot accompany you in mission. You know that God can use anyone? At times, nominating committees meet at the end of the year for church, and it's hard to find someone who is good enough to serve. Hey, and I don't, I don't blame us. Let me tell you, as a church, we have in our history, in our history, there was something called the shut, the shut door church. And it was, this was a church that kept people out because the, the moment you come in as a new believer, you still have to get perfected, you know, so... Uh, and, and Jesus is waiting to prepare a people so he can come, you know. Uh, you know, the Bible says that he will come uh, once the gospel is preached, okay? But, but, but uh, in our mentality, sometimes we think that he will come when we're perfect. You cannot be perfect, you know, till he comes. Am I making myself clear? Uh, you know, the Holy Spirit is working in you. But, but these people used to say, you know, so, so we don't have to perfect more people. So Jesus can come sooner. Let's keep him out. It was called the, door of the ch church of a, of a shut door. Of course, that church disappeared because when everybody died, they hadn't brought anybody else in, the church was done. So the church has survived in Adventism. It's a, door, it is, it's a church of the open door. Amen? Amen? May your churches be churches of the open door. Amen? Ah. You can tweet that too, Roger. Amen. 
God will use whoever he wants to. Even if you don't feel, feel that they are fit to be used, God, that, God can use them. Question. Would this lady that Jesus found at the well, would she have been fit to serve at your church? Would she have made it through nominating committee a life? Ha! Let's read here quickly. John 4, 28 and 30. We're going to the end of the chapter here. And it says there, John 4, 28 to 30. Juan 4, 28 al 30. That's right. I just heard someone. And it says there, then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Verse 30 says that they came out of the town and made their way towards Jesus. And verse 39 says, many of the Samaritan, Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Can someone say amen? amen. God used her. God used her to save an entire city. Can someone say amen? Isn't that beautiful? Amen. At times as, as Adventists, we like to limit and we like to control. And it is okay to help people to do better. But God will use whoever he wants to use. I'm talking to church leaders here. Please, in the name of Jesus, stop being obsessed with the behavior of others. Stop using church boards to discuss behaviors of people. And begin to use your church board to see how you're going to bless people and reach people for Jesus. Can someone say amen? amen. Stop using church boards to argue about uh, what is uh, he doing and what is she doing. And, and begin to use church boards to see how you can help them so they can do better. And how you can, how you can do better so your community can come to Jesus. Amen. amen. And stop trying to limit someone who can come in and, and who has to wait, you know, uh, work with them. And, and as they make decisions for Jesus, let them in and continue to work with them. Am I making myself clear? Amen. Amen. You see, Jesus could have used the disciples. But you see, the disciples hated the Samaritans, so Jesus could not use the disciples. Jesus could have used the disciples, but the disciples would have never talked to the woman. So Jesus could not use the disciples, so he had to use the woman. At the beginning, I told you that Jesus went to seek her because the woman needed him. Now I'm going to tell you that Jesus came to seek her because he needed the woman. Can someone say amen? amen. With all of our sins. With all of her flaws, with all of her shortcomings, Jesus needed the woman, and Jesus needs you with all of your shortcomings. Amen. Amen. Never be so whole that you do not allow others who don't behave exactly like you want them to behave. You keep them from going in mission with you when Jesus is wanting. I'm willing to use them. Amen? Amen. I want to say this. Some people can save people. Only Jesus can save. But some people can reach people that only they can reach. And you will never be able to reach. So let them walk beside you in mission. And let Jesus use them for the building of the kingdom. Amen? Amen. Pastor Tony Campolo. As the three, five ladies exited the, the greasy, sleazy diner, he looked at the fat guy behind the counter and said, do they come here every night? And he said, yes, they do. Did I get the name of the young lady next to me correct? Her name is Agnes, right? And the fat guy, Harry, behind the counter said, yes, she's Agnes. 
And she's just a, such a wonderful person, but no one ever does anything good for her. <laughs> Pastor Tony Campolo looked at him and said, I'm thinking of something. And Harry, the fat guy behind the counter said, are you thinking of a birthday party? And Pastor Campolo said, yeah. Why don't we throw her a birthday party tomorrow? Do they come every time, every night at the same time? And he said, yeah, about 3, between 3 and 3.15, they are here. And, and, and Pastor Campolo said, let's throw her a birthday party tomorrow. And Pastor Campolo said, I'll buy the cake. And, and, and the fat guy behind the counter said, no, 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 that's my specialty. Ah, I'll make the cake. That's my specialty. I'll make the cake. Uh, you get the decorations. Pastor Campolo said, I'll get the decorations. The day passed. Pastor Campolo bought decorations, went and kept his preaching appointments, speaking appointments in Honolulu, uh, woke up again early that day and, and showed up around 2.45 a.m. To, to decorate the place before they came in. And as he walked into the, into the hall in the wall, into the uh, sleazy, greasy uh, diner, uh, he came in and he was surprised because he was filled from wall to wall of prostitutes from Honolulu. <laughs> Harry had spread the word and said, come, we're going to have a birthday party. And now he's like trying to decorate the place with all of these ladies. And he's really wondering, what would my church think if he saw me here in Honolulu doing this at this time? Finished decorating, turned off the lights. Pastor Campolo, because they want to achieve that surprise factor when she comes in. So Pastor Campolo is, you know, it's like, man, lights off all of these ladies in here. This is crazy. I, I, I don't know. I hope no one in my church ever gets to find out about this. He ended up writing a letter. And at 3.15, the doors open up. Boom. And Agnes and her four friends walk in. And they turn on the lights and they say, happy birthday. And they start singing, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, dear Agnes. Happy birthday to you. And, and Agnes is like shaking and her, her knees are, she, she, she doesn't know what to do. And Harry comes from behind the counter, you know, with the cake. And the cake had a candle on it. And Harry says, Agnes, blow the candle, blow the candle. If you don't blow the candle, I will. And soon he blows up, the, he blows the candle. Ah. And then he says, Agnes, uh, take the cake, take the cake. And Agnes takes the cake again, as if it was the Holy Grail. And everyone is just in silence looking at Agnes. And Agnes is looking at the cake. And, and Harry says, we all want cake. Please, let's cut the cake that we might all be able to have some cake. And, but Agnes still looking at the cake. And finally, Harry says, Agnes, if you want, you can keep the cake. You can take it home if you want. And she said, can I? I have a few kids who have never seen at home who have never seen a birthday cake. Harry says, go ahead, take the cake. And she says, everyone, my house is right around the corner. I promise you I'll be right back. And she walks out into the night. Holding the cake. Now Pastor Campolo is left without cake. Celebration has ended. And he's there with all of these ladies of the night. And he says, all of a sudden, I didn't know what to do. So I just said, let's hold hands and let's pray. And like they all held hands and he prayed. And he prayed for Agnes. And he prayed for all of those ladies. And for the fat guy. And then as he finished praying, everyone said bye and everybody left. And Pastor Campolo is left there with Harry, the fat guy. And Harry looks at him and says, you are a preacher. You are a pastor. You never told me, but you are a pastor. And Pastor Campolo, feeling discovered, he said, yes, I am. And Harry says, what kind of church do you pastor? What kind of church do you pastor? Because I've never seen a church that does these kind of things. What type of church do you pastor? Pastor Campolo didn't know what to say. 
I replied, I pastor a church that throws birthday parties for prostitutes at 3 a.m. in the morning. We serve a God that is so good. A God who embraces the untouchable, the rejected, and the forgotten. A God who has new mercies every morning for you and for me and for those who are different than we are. Amen. But not only he embraces us, but he has promised to use us for the growth and the multiplication of his kingdom. Amen. Amen. So as I, as we go today, I want to have a prayer. But I want to pray for those of you who want to make a commitment with Jesus today and say, I'm going to go back to my church. I'm going to go back to my community. I'm going to go back to my home and to my family and I'm promised Jesus I promise you that I will try my best to embrace the rejected the forgotten the untouchable I'm going to go back to my church and rather than looking at people funny because they are not dressed the way I would dress I will embrace them I will embrace them I'm going to go back and, and look at the people that don't eat exactly like I would like for them to eat and I will embrace them because Jesus would do that. I will look at my neighbors who are not living the type of life that I want them to live and that Jesus would want them to live, but, but I still will embrace him because that's what Jesus would do. 
I will look at the young man and the young woman who are having issues and, and I will embrace him because that's what, that's what Jesus does. If you want to make that commitment with Jesus today, I want to see you stand because I want to pray for you. And I'm already standing up. I know it's not easy. I know it's easier said than done. But can you imagine, Pastor Leslie, if everybody here goes out to embrace people who need Jesus? What can happen in Carolina? Maybe 1,500 people will come to church, maybe 2,000. Can you imagine having to build more churches because we have more people, because we, we, don't, we cannot feed the people who are coming to Jesus in the places that we have? Ah, that could happen if we love them. If we lift Jesus and we begin to treat them like Jesus would, perhaps they will come. Number two. Not only embrace him, but let them work with you. I'm not asking that you make him head elders of your churches, but give him an opportunity. Engage him in a small group. Ask him to pray one day. Ask him to serve by setting up shares, by bringing something. Uh, uh, you know, if they cannot cook something good enough for Paul Luck, at least, at least to put the shares on the tables or decorate something for Paul Luck. Ask them to talk to their friends about Jesus. There are people that they know that you will never, that you have never known, and probably you will never know because all of your friends are Adventists. They know the ones who need Jesus more than you do. Because we usually gather together while they're out there. Will you make a commitment with Jesus that you will give an opportunity to serve with you? And rather than limiting them and, and, and keeping them away let them accompany you in mission if you want to make that commitment I would like for, to see your hand because hey I see some hands going up those churches are going to do very well amen and one last question is there someone here that perhaps came as a friend came with a friend who has not given his or her life to Jesus yet, hasn't been baptized. I realize that here, most of you are leaders. All of you are leaders. But I, as a, as a good evangelist, I, I always try to make sure that I make that appeal. I'm talking to adults. I'm talking to young, younger generations, to children, youth, teens, young adults. Perhaps you're here, and you have never been baptized. And you have never given your life to Jesus. So I'm about to pray. But I don't know if there is someone that hasn't been baptized yet and would like to say, hey, pastor, I know that Jesus loves me like crazy. I love Jesus too, and soon I want to be baptized soon. If you're somewhere, can you please put your hand up? Because I want to pray for you. This is the most important decision you can make in your life. So if there is someone it's okay. Put your hand up. Someone is going to give you a hug. We're going to pray for you. I always take a little bit of time with my appeals, and I know you're hungry. So am I. Because ah. someone is there that may need to make a decision for Jesus today. So if you haven't made a decision for Jesus yet, and you want to make that decision today, today is the day. Today is the day. I'm about to pray. Do we have anyone? I see, I see a little hand up. Is that a hand up there? Okay. Can someone say amen? Can someone, can you bring that young lady here, please? And don't, don't let her come by herself. Someone come with her, all right? It's okay. It's okay, baby. It's all right. You see, a young lady just gave her, her life to Jesus. She wants to be baptized. Let's put our hands together. God bless you, beautiful. That's the best decision that you could ever make in your life. Jesus, la mejor decisión que pudiera hacer en tu vida. Anybody else? If there is someone, just just rush up here, come up here and join. Hey, look. God bless you, sir. The best decision you can make in your life, and you made it right here in Meadow Beach. We're about to pray. 
But where are you? You have someone next to you that need to make, needs to make that decision and is feeling a little shy? Bring, bring, bring him, bring her. You know, we're about to pray. That's why we always make invitations. Because there are people waiting to be invited to follow Jesus. Anybody else? You there? If you're ready to come forward, this is the moment. I'm going to ask your president to pray for you. Pastor Leslie, come forward. And pray for your church. This is Jesus' church, but it's the church that he has given you to lead in this territory. And I would like for you to pray for this young man and young woman who have made decisions for Jesus and others who may be making decisions for Jesus and will be coming at some point. For those that are saying we will embrace those who are forgotten, rejected, and untouchable, we're going to love on them and embrace them like Jesus does. And also pray for those who are saying, and we will give them an opportunity to go on the journey with us so the kingdom of God can be multiplied. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And I know that it's the presence of the Lord. And Father, I, all heaven rejoices this Sabbath morning at two hearts that have given themselves to you. Bless this young man and this young girl. Embrace them with your presence. And in a world filled with so many distractions, keep them close to your heart. I pray for all those that have gathered here. Today, Father, Pastor Jose has given us a challenge to go back to our homes and to our churches, to our communities, and to reach a world that is so desperately in need of Jesus. And Lord, if there's any other heart here that hasn't made that full surrender, I pray that your Holy Spirit's voice will never leave them, but will continue to tug at their hearts until they make that full surrender. One day soon, we're going to be home with you. We're going to see you face to face. Oh God, may that day come soon. And then the prayer of our, of your beloved servant John. We pray that prayer together. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Give a hug to the person next to you and tell him, I love you. God loves you. Have a beautiful rest of the day. Amen.